Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Susan Velakis, and I'm the Training Development Coordinator for now. And as such, I bring you these webinars on the third Thursday of each month. So welcome. We have an excellent presentation for you today on a subject very near and dear to my heart, recycling the non-recyclables through TerraCycle. TerraCycle is a global leader in the collection and repurposing of hard to recycle waste. TerraCycle currently operates in 21 countries and works with some of the world's largest brands, retailers, cities, and manufacturers to create national platforms to recycle products and packaging that currently go to landfill or incineration. So whether you're familiar with TerraCycle or not, this webinar will not only open your eyes to the condition of our current global waste problems, but more importantly, to the solutions that TerraCycle is providing worldwide. And here to start us off is Amber Serta, our Director of Marketing at NOW. So welcome, Amber. Thank you, Sue. I am excited to share that since NOW started working with TerraCycle back in 2018, we have diverted more than 1 million pieces of NOW non-recyclable packaging from landfills. And this wouldn't be possible without the participation of our retailers and consumers who have actively collected the packaging and returned it to TerraCycle. This includes our food and supplement pouches, our drink sticks, and personal care and toothpaste tubes. NOW's partnership with TerraCycle is an investment that we feel is very important as part of our ongoing sustainability efforts. In honor of Earth Month, we are so happy to be joined by Tom Sackey, founder and CEO of TerraCycle for today's presentation. All right, thank you. That's amazing. It sounds like through a joint effort, we are certainly doing our part to protect the planet. And before we turn this presentation over, Amber, I would like to tell our audience a little bit about Mr. Tom Zaki because he is not only the founder and CEO of TerraCycle, but he has also authored several books, Revolution in a Bottle, Outsmart Waste, Make Garbage Great, and The Future of Packaging. He also created, produced, and starred in TerraCycle's reality show, Human Resources, which aired three 10-episode seasons on Pivot and is syndicated in over 20 foreign markets and is also available to stream on Amazon and iTunes, so you might want to check that out. He also writes for media outlets such as Green Biz, Meaningful Business, and Packaging Europe. In 2019, TerraCycle, along with 25 top consumer product companies and retailers, launched a new circular reuse platform called Loop, which enables consumers to purchase some of their favorite household and food products in durable, reusable packaging. Loop is a key step in helping to end the epidemic of waste that is caused by single-use consumption. It is currently available in France, Canada, the UK, Japan, and the United States. And that's not all, because aside from all that, Mr. Tom Zaki also serves on numerous boards, including the Daddario Foundation, World Economic Forum, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and he is on the Corporate Advisory Council of the Product Stewardship Institute, just to name a few. Mr. Zaki and TerraCycle have received hundreds of social, environmental, and business awards and recognition from a range of organizations, including the United Nations, United Chamber of Commerce, Fortune Magazine, Time Magazine, World Economic Forum, and the Schwab Foundation. And in his spare time, Mr. Zaki is a frequent global lecturer, including regular appearances at NYU Stern School of Business, Princeton University, Wharton School of Business, Harvard Business School, and Yale University. And with all that, it is my extreme pleasure to welcome you, Tom, to today's presentation, Recycling the Non-Recyclables Through TerraCycle. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, everyone who's listening uh, for uh, inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I get to talk to you really today about my favorite topic in, uh, uh, out there, one that we've uh, dedicated my life to and our organization is dedicated to, which is understanding and ideally solving uh, for the idea of waste. And in today's discussion, I want to share with you, you know, not just the journey of how this all came to be, uh, but what have been our learnings along the way for using business as a force of good? And how do we move from a linear or take make waste system to a circular one and ideally progressively more circular? So we'll touch on a few themes and then look forward to uh, chatting a little bit at the end of uh, the discussion today. 
So first, as a little bit of background, in case you, uh, uh, you know, may be new to TerraCycle, we've been around for 20 years. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, we operate in 21 countries uh, around the world uh, uh, as a mission-driven uh, enterprise trying to eliminate the idea of waste. So all the learnings and uh, things I'll be sharing with you today come from the countries you see here. Now, there's a little bit of color coding here. So in Thailand, we operate, it's our one country where we operate as a non-profit organization. Then everywhere else, we operate as a mission-driven for-profit. Uh, countries in green, like Brazil and China, uh, we run our recycling services. And in countries like the United States, uh, we operate not just our recycling services, but also innovations in waste, from diagnostics all the way to reuse, which I'll share a little bit with you as, uh, as we go today. But I thought it would be a fun place to start at the very, very beginning. And uh, you know, just to give you a little context, so my, my personal journey and how I got into really dedicating uh, you know, my time to this, uh, this topic was, well, you know, in, 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 uh, I was born in the early 80s in, in Budapest, which is only really relevant uh, because it was still communist at the time under the Iron Curtain. Uh, uh, so, you know, with, with our neighbors in Ukraine have a lot of empathy for what's happening today with, uh, with the Russian aggression. And uh, in 86, actually sort of tied to Ukraine, Chernobyl occurred. I was four at the time, and uh, that nuclear meltdown destabilized the borders, and my parents, as refugees uh, with me in tow, were able to escape and landed in Germany, then Holland, then Belgium, effectively seeking asylum as political refugees. And finally, three years later, at the age of seven, uh, we settled in Canada. And then from there, I went to college in the United States, uh, in New Jersey, and that's where I'm speaking to you from today. Now, I mentioned this journey because I went from communism to, to capitalism and really fundamentally fell in love with the power uh, and the opportunity of entrepreneurship. I mean, it's really the American dream. Uh, uh, and, you know, to be fair, I fell in love with it for selfish reasons. I figured it was my ticket to fame and fortune. Um, so at 14, I started my first company and, you know, went off to the races. And I remember this huge turning point, uh, uh, which was one of the first classes I took at Princeton was uh, Economics 101. And the professor, in a very appropriate way as an introduction to economics, gets up on stage and asks, what's the purpose of business? And I was hoping for some very inspiring answer, though the answer she was looking for was simply maximize profit for shareholders. And you know, it took a little bit of the wind out of my sails because I figured business is here to serve, you know, how does it make society or the planet better? And that Profit is more an indicator of health than it is the reason of being. You know, if you're profitable, then presumably you will flourish and grow. And if you're not profitable, well, the opposite will happen. But is it really the reason of being? And so I had this itch to try to find uh, business concepts uh, to work on uh, that were purposeful first and put profit not as the purpose, but as the indicator of will it be successful or unsuccessful. And, you know, most companies don't have the image of the founding moment, but this is the moment TerraCycle was invented freshman year of college, and uh, my friends had been growing certain plants in their basement. You can see their peat in the glasses, giving them a shot. Uh, these have become a little bit more friendly to, uh, to enjoy in the, in the recent years, but back then, uh, you know, he was in his basement. Uh, he was doing the best he could, but couldn't make them work. And one day, he starts taking organic waste and feeding them uh, uh, to worms and taking the worm poop and feeding it to the plants, and miraculously, the plants started doing incredibly well. And so I got really intrigued by this whole idea, you know, not just because of the results, but because he was taking organic food waste, which is 50% uh, of the food we produce in the world ends up as waste. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of waste and that he was taking that, something that's effectively a liability and turning it into a positive. And this started this lifelong fascination with the concept of, of garbage. I mean, take a step back, right? Everything we produce will one day belong to the garbage industry. That's a really big idea here. You know, everything from the flooring to the wall behind you to the clothes on your back will be property of a garbage company. And for how big that idea is, it's also the least innovative industry per dollar of revenue it enjoys. Frankly, because we want to be, we're repulsed by waste. We want to be as far away from it as fast as possible. In fact, it was that principle of all organisms being repulsed by their waste that we created, uh, you know, TerraCycle effectively because of this inspiration started as a worm poop company and created a massive system that converted organic waste uh, uh, to worm poop. And the same theory played out here. This is basically a big toilet for worms, moving worms into food and away from their own waste as fast as humanly possible. Now, as a startup, you know, you would hope to get investors and unfortunately no one was interested in investing in TerraCycle at this time. And so we found ourselves in a really desperate moment early in our history, which was we had all this worm poop we had produced, we you know, bankrupted all the money that I had saved up from my prior entrepreneurial activities uh, and, and credit cards and so on to build what you see pictured here. 
and we needed to start making some revenue, selling our product. And since we couldn't afford packaging, I remember this so clearly, we went through all the recycling containers in, uh, in, in, in the town that we were living in and uh, decided to package and use packaging. And this became our first product ever. Quite literally, liquid worm poop in a used soda bottle. And we learned some really interesting things about waste, some sort of noble truths, if you will. The first uh, is that garbage is standardized, right? So in the world of beverage containers, there's only four volumes that make up any, any uh, uh, noticeable uh, uh, volume of bottles. There are half liter bottles, 20 ounce bottle, the bottle you see pictured here, one liter and two liter bottles. And the rest of the shapes and sizes make up less than a tenth of a percentage point. So they're basically negligible. And within a bottle type, like 20 ounce, as you see pictured here, all the important things on running it through a high-speed bottling line are identical. The base, the tread on the cap, the height of the bottle. The only difference is actually the shape of the bottle. And that led us to the second major realization. After we started getting this product listed at Walmart and Home Depot and Target, you know, in the U.S., um, we got letters, in fact, uh, a week apart from the lawyers at Coke and then separately the lawyers at Pepsi, saying that we were infringing on their unique shape by using their used waste packaging to package our product. And it turned out that garbage, and they were right, by the way, has intellectual property rights. That was a, it was a really interesting lesson to learn, which led us to a third very important realization, because by this time, I had uh, dropped out of school. We took an abandoned building in the middle of Trenton and turned it into this really cool green manufacturing space. In fact, that all since then has been converted to office space, which is where I'm actually speaking to you from today. And everything was oozing purpose. We were collecting soda bottles from uh, schools nearby. Uh, we were, again, rehabilitating buildings in the middle of one of the toughest cities in the United States uh, and taking organic waste and feeding it to make our worm poop. You can imagine everything was trying to show that business could be a force for good. And uh, so the attorneys of these two organizations came down on separate days. And when they saw this, they ended up completely changing their point of view and giving us the world's first, and I believe still only license to package shit in their distinctive shape and sell it. And this, you know, while sort of a comedic story, if you will, opened my, my eyes to the power of purpose. You know, today more and more when people work at organizations, they want to first ask, what does the organization do? Can I be proud of it? And then what is my compensation? Um, purpose opens doors to access senior leadership. It opens, you know, people help you. It generates more media. It is incredibly valuable, arguably perhaps just as valuable as the concept of a brand. And so we were off to the races. You know, within a few years, we had uh, built the organization to, you know, a few million dollar a year worm poop enterprise and you know, everything was great. And we asked ourselves a key question. If our mission is to eliminate the idea of waste, are we going to do that by making consumer products? You know, and now, right, you guys make consumer products. And so the product is the hero of your business equation. And as such, uh, I'm sure you spend huge amounts of time and effort to make sure that you use the very best ingredients, that you make the very best product. Now, imagine if you were uh, TerraCycle and you had a rule that the product must be made from waste. Well, you would make it from waste to respect the rule, but you would still pick the very best ingredients. And we found we were doing that. We were taking uncrushed soda bottles as packaging versus uh, soda bottles that may have been driven over by a tractor at the uh, recycling facility. We were using certain types of organic waste, but not other types of organic waste. And we said, you know what, this is not the path to solve all waste. How do we bring solutions to dirty diapers or cigarette butts or uh, uh, toothpaste tubes and many other things? And so we took a big step back and we asked ourselves to explore the very idea of waste. Because if you think about the idea of waste, it is not a, not a natural concept. It doesn't exist in nature. And there are outputs of organisms, right? A chimpanzee, for example, uh, has stuff that goes in a toilet. In, uh, uh, it has uh, the carbon dioxide it exhales. It also has uh, its, its body parts you know, while it's living. And then once it passes away, it has the body itself. Those are all waste streams to a chimpanzee that no other chimpanzee wants to touch. In fact, they want to be as far away from it as possible. But those outputs are incredibly important inputs to other organisms that feed on those outputs. So humans have invented something really unique. Outputs that are useless to humans, but are also useless to anything else. And that, I would argue, is the definition of waste. It's why you know, turtles think that uh, uh, fishing nets are seaweed or uh, uh, crabs are uh, 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 taking up house in, in garbage, or, cig or birds building their nests from cigarette butts, and so on. This is really the way to think about waste, because humans have had outputs for many, many years. 
But it was really in the 1950s that we started creating outputs that no one wants. And what happened in the 1950s? Well, two things came onto the scene. First, we started consuming at a rate we have never in our history consumed before. To give you a statistical uh, 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 number to this, we today consume 10 times more stuff than we did before the 1950s. I mean, just think about how many socks are in one of our drawers than our grandparents. How many shirts do we have? How big are our homes? How many cars do we have? And so on and so forth. And what, what, what makes it worse is not just the aggregate volume of consumption, but that what we consume are made from materials, wonderful materials, but materials nevertheless that nature has no use for. You know, plastics and, uh, and other polymers and so on. And not just in the world of polymers, but it could be different forms, whether it's fibers or alloys that also have no useful uh, need for anything else. And of course, this is what it looks like in a little bit more of an extreme sort of visual, but so does if you walk down the store of a Walmart or anywhere else, it's effectively the same thing. So where does the waste go today? All this stuff, mind you, 99% of it, which becomes garbage within the year of purchase. 25% still is informally disposed. You know, ending up uh, uh, on beaches, in our oceans, and so on. About two to three percent is recycled, and the balance is burned or buried. Now, burning and burying, or more fancy names would be landfilling and incineration or waste to energy conversion, would be equivalent to the cheapest legal ways to dispose of this material. And regulation moves us into higher end solutions than lower end. So, countries with low regulation, maybe it's very informal, which is a fancy word for littering. In countries with high regulation, like Western Europe, it would be waste to energy conversion. So all this backdrop leads to a question, which is what makes something actually recyclable, which is the first step, I would argue, in the circular economy transition. And you know, I, I think there's a misunderstanding here, or maybe uh, uh, focusing in the wrong area, because if you ask citizens, and we've validated this through a lot of consumer insights, citizens will say, what is recyclable is what I can put in my blue bin and everything else is not possible to recycle, which is why I cannot put it in my recycling bin. The industry, manufacturers and retailers typically say, well, it has to do with the way my product or package is constructed and the available infrastructure to process it. And I would argue it's not quite either of those because doesn't infrastructure appear when there are good business equations and disappear when there are bad business equations? And it turns out everything in the world is actually technically recyclable. So it's not about the construct of the material. The construct really improves its economic potential to be recycled versus harms it. And so in the end, because garbage companies and recyclers are private for-profit enterprises, serving, of course, maximization of profit to their shareholders, what makes something recyclable is simply can a garbage company make money. That is it. And the equation for can a garbage company make money is what you see in the circles. Garbage companies have the cost of collecting the waste and processing it. And if that cost is higher, then what they can sell the recycled material for? It will not be recycled. And inversely, if it is, if the costs are lower, that is, than the resulting materials, like an aluminum can, it will be recycled. Now, once you know that, it's actually really interesting because then you can start playing with this and understanding how do we start bringing recycling solutions uh, to things that are typically considered not uh, recyclable. And that starts the journey from a linear economy where we extract materials, make a product, and then dispose them to starting to bend the circle into a somewhat circular. I say somewhat because it's not quite a circle yet, but it's on its way. And if we take that same theory that things are recyclable because a garbage company can or cannot make money, this is what packaging ends up or products look like. Some things are highly recyclable, um, like aluminum cans, because the aluminum is incredibly valuable and funds those costs. It's like if I littered gold, no one would complain. They'd happily pick it up behind me. But other things like a, a, a tube or a pouch or these sort of things, the good news is are technically recyclable, but they cost more to collect and process than the results are worth. And that's why they are unfortunately not recycled by local recyclers. And so this led us to, well, what is the solution? What is the business equation to solve this? And this is TerraCycle's entire business equation. We charge. Uh, an organization like now who uh, uh, proudly funds uh, national recycling programs through us to, uh, to cover the cost of collecting the waste, that is getting it from the uh, uh, point the waste occurs to a point where it can be processed, then process the waste minus whatever the material of that recycled waste is worth. It's worth something. It's just not enough to cover the cost of processing and collection. And that cost, which is the dark green circle, 
uh, is uh, what it costs to effectively set up a way to recycle things that are today not locally recyclable. But then there's a big lesson I've learned in stewarding purposeful activity, whether it's around waste or frankly any environmental or social issue that one may care about, is that if an organization is to really lean in and fund year over year, and then ideally even grow the funding year over year, what's so important is to make sure more ROI or return on investment is driven than cost, because that makes it a smart business equation. And so where does ROI come from? in these sort of programs? Well, certainly it comes from sustainability, right? We now are able to recycle packaging, like now packaging that previously may not have been recycled, but also drives good publicity and communication. But it also drives the ability to get benefit at retailers and uh, be able to work with retailers, uh, to drive foot traffic and, make, uh, and bring sustainability to the retail environment. And all these different things are important and the more we can drive ROI, the bigger recycling programs tend to become. So how do they work? Well, the waste, of course, has to be collected, processed, but then also value has to be driven. And so we're super excited uh, that we uh, together have been working and collecting already over a million pieces of packaging uh, through the Now Recycling program. It's entirely free. You can go to terracycle.com to access it. Uh, uh, and then from there, you can recycle from anywhere. The instructions are clearly on, on, the, uh, uh, on the website. And uh, so if you're not yet a part of this program, we would encourage you to please take part uh, and uh, start recycling uh, your packaging uh, uh, with NOW and TerraCycle. And just to give you a little detail, basically once you've visited the website, you can become a collection point for the NOW packaging. You just take any cardboard box you may have, you know, it could be at your place of worship, at, uh, at your, uh, where you work out, at your business, at your school, uh, wherever it may be, at your, uh, uh, at your retail location. Uh, start filling it with that packaging form. And then when you're done, you request a, uh, a pickup uh, and then that's sent to us. And there's even the ability to earn rewards uh, for recycling. And through these types of platforms, we found that everything, absolutely everything in the world can go circular. Now, before we go into examples, there's a hierarchy of what is the best for waste uh, 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 and what is the, the, the most sustainable and the least sustainable. And we'll go from the bottom up. The least sustainable, actually even below landfill, is littering. That would be like informal uh, uh, leakage, or, or better words for that, but nevertheless, it's where you just throw it into the environment. That's the worst thing to do. We should all avoid it. Better than that is landfilling. That's sort of like controlled litter. Let's just put our litter all in one place and manage it well. Better than that is incinerate. Better than that is incinerate with energy recovery. And those would be our linear solutions. Circular solutions begin with recycling. Recycling is where you value the material that that waste is made from, the composition. Upcycling, it is where you value the material and the form of the waste. Uh, so, uh, 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 but maybe not its intention. And reuse is where you value all three of those things. So what does this look like? Here's, for example, how 35 million plants uh, were packaged in reused margarine containers recently at Walmart. That's an example of disposable packaging in reuse. Upcycling is like this bag that's made from compressed shopping bags uh, by Target or this jacket that we made from Doritos for Colbert. This is where you don't change the form or the composition of the waste, but you do change the intention. But the vast majority of the waste that is collected goes into the third solution, recycling. These same chip bags here are made into shipping trucks with Frito-Lay, where 30% of the plastics have been replaced with used potato chip bags. With the now packaging, we collect it. Uh, 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 we then clean out any content residue that may be on the inside, especially on something like a tube uh, or any powder that may be on the inside. From there, we separate uh, into material types because there's different polymers at play in, in the packaging to keep the food and the content safe and fresh. Then from there, we make it into plastics that turn into the type of objects you can see here from benches to trash cans to shipping pallets and, uh, and lots of other things. What we have found through this type of solution is everything can go around, whether it's cities, 400 cities today, collecting and recycling cigarettes, uh, that's pictured in Vancouver, from aerosol containers into exercise parks, from flip-flops into playgrounds, uh, cosmetic waste, uh, personal protective equipment like the face masks, and this is a really important point is that it's not just community locations that collect, it's also retailers. If you're a retailer or work with retailers, we strongly encourage you to get involved in the Now Recycling Program, because this way consumers can proudly be able to recycle uh, the package forms that uh, they couldn't before this program existed. And this also drives foot traffic, goodwill, all sorts of wonderful things uh, uh, for partnering retailers. 
So whether it's 10,000 optometrists around uh, the US and Canada collecting and recycling contact lenses, to even guitar string recycling, um, uh, uh, anything can go around. Even big objects, uh, like, uh, 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 for example, car seats. Uh, actually, when we did this with uh, Walmart a few years ago, we collected 10% of all the car seats sold in America in 48 hours. Even dirty diapers can be recycled, which I fondly would call quite literally a shit show. Um, this is actually live in Holland, Japan, and France, collecting and recycling dirty diapers, whether it's blister packs, pharmaceutical locations, and so on. Now, what you've seen so far is a lot of examples where we're recycling one waste stream at a time. What's really inspiring is the big trend we're seeing right now out there in the world is moving to multiple waste stream systems. Here, this is in Australia, for example, collection and recycling everything from pens to batteries. Or a kiosk we developed in Germany, recycling everything from aerosols to uh, 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 flexible food packaging. Even an example in France, where it's multi-brands coming together, uh, competitors recycling razor blades to tubes, uh, to cosmetics. Even large mega systems like this in Asda, or what you will see in Walmart just in a few weeks from now, collecting and recycling 12 different waste streams. But it's also important to have fun. Here's an example we did with PepsiCo at some major sporting events. Uh, this is actually before, just before COVID in Spain, where the bin itself would light up and play you know, uh, an exciting sound and lights when you would put your bottle in for either Liverpool or the competitive team. If you watch the Olympics, uh, not the ones uh, just most recently in uh, China, but in, in uh, Japan, and you saw a, uh, an athlete standing up and proudly getting a medal, the podium that they were standing on was built by TerraCycle, all from hard to recycle waste collected in retail locations across Japan. Now, it's not always possible to do this through a for-profit model. So through the TerraCycle Foundation, we are deploying things we can't do through a for-profit model. Here in, uh, or for example, as pictured in Thailand, we are right now cleaning up a large number of canals, last year alone pulling 1 million pounds of hard to recycle waste that is floating in the canals before it enters our oceans. Now, this gets us to bending the circular economy, uh, the linear economy, I apologize, into somewhat of a circle, but not quite a circle. We have to go one step further to make it truly circular, and that is about starting to use recycled content to make our products and packages. And you notice when you do that, the need to extract new materials goes down. And by the way, extraction of materials from the earth, whether it's mining or farming or any other way to extract, is what creates the most impact on the planet, whether it's climate change, uh, deforestation, species diversity loss, waste, you name it, it's all linked to extraction. And so in the second division of what we focus on, which is what we call making things from recycled materials, our key question centers around how do we work with companies to integrate recycled waste back into uh, their products? And so that can range from uh, what we call storied materials that are taking materials from all sorts of places in the world. I showed you this picture earlier, but that waste actually ends up in these shampoo bottles. From rock and roll festival waste into deodorant containers, all the way to a project where today we're cleaning up the top of Mount Everest, which also uh, shockingly is a landfill, and turning them into luxury Swiss watches. There's so many ways to embrace recycled content. And so this is a huge uh, sort of encouragement, no matter where you are in an organization, the more you can be a demand for recycled content, the more we're gonna be enabling the circular economy to really function. And that gets us to a circular economy based on recycling, but we're not done. Because the next step in the circular economy transition is to tighten the circle. So uh, uh, going to fewer steps, using less energy, and typically going from an open loop to a closed loop. And we believe the next step there is shifting from recycling, which is perhaps the best thing to do with disposable products, and of course, making from recycled content, to reuse, which is fewer steps along the way of getting a product back into a consumer's hand. And we do that through a division we call loop. Now, again, as I mentioned in this theory of waste earlier, it's important to take a step back and think about how the world used to be, because it functioned quite well. And back before the 1950s, this is how we would deliver, you know, receive milk. It was also a time we cobbled our shoes, mended our socks, uh, lived a very, very different life. But in the world of consumables, a strange thing was happening in these milkman models. The packages were treated like an asset. They were securitized by deposit, and the manufacturer was motivated to make them long-lasting and durable. And so what happened? In the 1950s, and by the way, this is a positive photo from the 1950s, of course, today it looks a little, little uh, uh, scary. 
but we chose it because it's an authentically positive photo and the actors in this photo were smiling because disposability brought about unparalleled product range, affordability, and convenience. But a strange thing happened. The package became property of the consumer upon purchase. And is there a single disposable package that anyone wants to own when there's no content inside? I imagine no. By the way, so that means giving up ownership is no big deal. So the question we asked ourselves is how do we solve the unintended consequences of disposability while maintaining the virtues? And we looked a lot at where is the world of reuse today? And there's many ways to experience reuse. There are uh, refill stations that have become popular in certain retail locations. There's the ability to fill with concentrate, uh, you know, like take a window cleaner and put a tablet in and dilute with water. There's the ability to do prefill, which is sort of like how the uh, propane tanks in America work or beer kegs or, well, frankly, the entire beverage industry of Germany. So as we mapped out these uh, options for reuse, we found that prefill, we believe, is what's going to have the highest chance of scale. Because first, it can ap apply to any product. Uh, while only certain things can go through a refill station or be concentrated. That's the size of the circle here. But it also brings what we believe is high levels of convenience for both the business actors, retailers and brands, and the consumer. But there's a problem today with prefill. You know, here in the United States, our beer kegs and our propane tanks are prefill reuse. But when your beer keg is empty, you can't take it to wherever you got the propane tank. And when the propane tank is empty, you can't take it to wherever you bought your beer. And so, the idea here to solve that is to create a platform for reuse, where you can buy anywhere and return anywhere. And in fact, the flow you see in that chart is live today. This is in the UK. You can buy your coffee from McDonald's in a reusable loop container, then drop it to Tesco, which is their leading grocer, uh, then buy your laundry detergent, again, in a reusable container, and uh, drop it off at a Burger King, and so on and so forth. And we found that through reusable package design, there's a lot of very interesting virtues that can come to bear. With reusable packaging, not only is it more sustainable, but it can also be more luxurious, more function-filled, more exciting, because the package moves from being a cost that has to be embedded into every single purchase to an asset that uh, uh, rotates around. So this is what it looks like today. Retailers from Kroger on the right in the US to Carrefour in France on the left are now creating reusable sections uh, in their store of all your favorite products uh, from known brands in now reusable packaging that you can buy at one of these stores and then drop off anywhere to get your deposits back. And then we take the packaging, check it in, sort it, store it, clean it, and then provide it back to the brands that refill it and then around it goes. Whether it's again at a grocery store, all the way to a fast food uh, QSR, or quick serve restaurant uh, location. So what have been some of the lessons we learned along the way? First, convenience is everything. It's not about will people pay more for an organic product, which is usually the quintessential question, if you will. It's instead, is the convenience competitive with what I do today, which is a throwaway system? And that is everything. When convenience is present, then the question is, what are the features and benefits? And what is the price for those features and benefits? And this, I think, is the biggest and most important thing we have to crack in sustainability, is we need to make it incredibly convenient. And it has to be felt like an upgrade, not as a sacrifice. And I think today, a lot of sustainability could be seen as a sacrifice, right? Let me buy less. Let me you know, uh, shop differently. And what we have to do is not guilt people into sustainability, but seduce them into sustainability. I believe, for example, that's why the, uh, the uh, non-animal protein market has exploded with uh, you know, a lot of companies, like pictured here, you could see Impossible uh, Foods with the Impossible Burger, but it was Beyond Meat and many, many others. Uh, uh, they've done you know, well because they're not doing it through uh, uh, guilt, but they're doing it through, it's a great product at a good price competing directly with meat. Same with the electric cars. Uh, now taking over and effectively uh, uh, becoming the new standard. I don't think we'll see petrol cars uh, in 10 or 20 years uh, uh, being produced. And so this is so important because if you can solve for uh, convenience, amazing magical things can happen. Uh, for example, a Jinamoto in Japan, uh, this is their spice packaging on the left and coffee packaging on the right in loop, which is wonderful and beautiful as we already mentioned, but they're going a step further. They're impregnating real-time IoT to, uh, to measure temperature and humidity of the content. And that way, your expiration date on the package is adjusted real time. You can you know, scan the package, look at it on your app, and it will tell you 
if the package is uh, going to expire soon or the content will expire soon or later based on the temperature and the humidity in which you've been storing the package. And so this to me is what I believe is the future of consumption. It's not about just sacrifice and going back to the way the world was for our grandparents or their parents. I think it's truly a step into the future and a future that must, not should, but must be more sustainable, but also more exciting, more convenient, more feature filled. Because I think that's where people will gravitate. And so with that said, thank you for listening and hope this gives you a little taste in how we're trying to eliminate the idea of waste. Wow. I am blown away. I am completely blown away. Excellent. What an incredible journey, uh, an outstanding business principle, and just an excellent reminder of the importance. Um, as we were talking earlier, um, I came on board with Now Foods almost 25 years ago, and one of my first assignments was to create a recycle program for this 203,000 square foot facility. And I went, huh? <laughs> but um, I did my homework and I learned, and it, and like I said in the beginning, it became very, very near and dear to my heart. And um, so to see what you are doing is just amazing. And I had no idea. I knew of our program about TerraCycle, but I had no idea how extensive it actually is. So, wow, thank you for your efforts. Thank you. That is just thank amazing. You. Um, Amber, did you? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and you know, as Tom talked about, just convenience and making it easier for people, that's something that we really did want to uh, try to do in partnering with TerraCycle. So we've tried to make it easy and convenient for retailers to you know, sign up and be a part of this program with us and partner with us. So, um, I mean, it is really easy to do this. It's just going um, to TerraCycle.com and creating a free account. and. Um, Additionally, now we'll um, provide our retail customers with these bins at no cost. They're branded, you know, TerraCycle and now, and that's um, retailers can set these up in their stores. They serve as a, as a collection um, receptacle for our uh, packaging that we are trying to keep out of landfills. And so then once, you know, they have, um, enough collected, as Tom said, just, you know, can toss it into any other um, cardboard box, print out a free uh, shipping label on TerraCycle's website, and then send it off to TerraCycle. So we, you know, are trying to make it really easy for our retail customers, trying to make it easy for consumers to, you know, once they've used the packaging to return it back to um, our, to these stores. And then also, like Tom mentioned, I mean, it's really great that um, when retailers are returning this, they can also get points, which can in turn be then um, basically used to donate back to a charitable organization of their choice. So, um, I mean, it's just really a wonderful program. Um, we're proud to be a part of it. And, you know, we're learning and growing every day too. I mean, we recognize as a company, this is a journey. We've done a lot. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, but we know we can always do more. And this is, you know, this partnership is just um, one example. And again, we're really proud to be a partner with you guys. No, we, we really sincerely appreciate uh, working together and uh, uh, learning from each other and being able to bring this to as many retail locations as absolutely possible so that hopefully consumers truly everywhere will be able to access the NOW recycling program, I think is, uh, is what we're very focused on. And I know our teams are working together very hard on. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has any questions, you can always reach out to Now Foods. We have our um, our product info at nowfoods.com. Uh, generally, they answer questions about uh, products and things, but they will send them along to me, and I will um, I will get those questions answered for you. So again, product info at nowfoods.com. If you have any questions, concerns, how to get these recycle bins, how you can help, what you can do, um, just uh, send us an email, and we will we'll get you taken care of. So thank you again, Tom, for an excellent presentation and uh, love to see it and uh, best of luck going forward. Well, thank you. And thank you all for taking your time to listen. It's a real privilege to be able to share this moment with you and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Okay. Take care now. Thank you.